Halfway to 100, episode 50. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about what they didn't teach us in school, how to run a great business. Before we jump in today's segment, I'd just like to tell everyone about the business plan competition being put on by the Architect Shrek Group. Now, this business plan competition is intended to foster a dialogue about the importance of entrepreneurship to the future of the architecture profession. The competition is open to registered architects in the U.S. or Canada who have considered starting a design firm or who have operated an existing design firm for five years or less. There's no fee to enter. The deadline for registration, free registration, is March 28th. So that date is quickly coming up. It's going to be at the end of this week. There's a $10,000 prize for the winner. There's a second prize of $2,500. And in addition, there will be training where you will get the resources and group training to be able to write your business plan and figure out what it takes um, to lay the foundation for running a great business. So I encourage everyone to head on over to architectbusinessplancompetition.com or businessofarchitecture.com forward slash plan to find out more about that and learn about writing a great business plan. Today's segment is our second interview with Steve L. Wintner, AIA Emeritus. He's the founder and principal of Management Consulting Services, a professional consulting firm located in the Austin, Texas area, and focused on enhancing the productivity and profitability of professional design firms. He's the co-author of the book, Financial Management for Design Professionals, The Path to Profitability, which by the way, if you remember in my first episode, Osha Wilson talked about this book and recommended it as a necessary book if you're planning on moving into a management position or running your own firm. So Steve is currently working on a new and updated version of this with his co-author, Michael Tardiff, and I just want to welcome Mr. Wintner back to the show. Hi, Enoch. Thanks. Absolutely. It's good to have you back. And I I personally really enjoyed our conversation last week. I could tell that you have a very, very deep, deep knowledge of the business side of architecture. And so, I mean, it fits in perfectly with what we're trying to do here on this program, which is spread that information and make sure that people have the resources and the knowledge they need to make the correct decisions that can, as a whole, help architects be more prolific, flourish, and create better designs. So thank you for what you're doing and what you've devoted your life to. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, it's 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 true, and I mean it. And um, last, last week, just to give a summary, we talked a little bit about some of the common management problems or, uh, I guess, efficiencies that, that happen in architecture firms and how your suggestions for how things can be improved. Had a great conversation about employee re- retention policy, how to retain and uh, keep the best talent. Of course, that's a, that's a big investment. Also talked about communicating and accountability within firms. Now, I know, Steve, that you're working on you're working on two books now. It sounds like a lot. You're working on the rewrite for your book, Financial Management for Design Professionals, The Path to Profitability, and then also another book about the culture of accountability in professional design firms. Can you tell us just quickly about those two books? Well, yeah. Uh, as I had mentioned last week, uh, the first book it was published in 2006, and now that Michael and I, my co-author, Michael Tardis and I now have the uh, copyright ownership of the book. We're doing a rewrite of it to publish electronically as an ebook or a Kindle book or what other forms we might find uh, in the electronic digital media. And that'll be sometime later this year. And it's really nothing more than taking the book and, and enhancing what it was already published. We're, we're finding things that need to be clarified further, expanded a little bit further. We're finding things that need to be added that weren't in there that would be more helpful in expanding the things that we're trying to talk about that weren't mentioned in the first place, and uh, perhaps shortening other things that weren't nearly as important. So it's just really basically a cleanup and a, and a better version of the first version without making wholesale changes to it. The accountability book is something that I'm just beginning the process of. I, I am going to uh, work with it with my co-author, Michael Tard, if we have agreed that we'll work together in developing it as we did the last time because we've had such a successful uh, 
successful process working this thing out and doing the things that we've done to create the book. So we've enjoyed the process. It's been beneficial to both of us, and it's rewarded us handsomely. So we're going to do that, but it's going to take a lot of uh, data gathering and understanding and trying to uh, pull together the things that I think will be beneficial in including in a book that I don't really know if there's anything out there in the marketplace that has specifically addressed that subject relative to our particular profession. Absolutely. I mean, not that I know of or that I've run across. It sounds like a an absolutely wonderful asset, and it's going to be another great contribution to the library of business of architecture. Thank you. So, you know, last last week you did talk a little bit about time management, and I was impressed, Steve, to be honest, the first time I talked to you, um, you know, you know, normally I do these video, I do these video interviews. I record them with uh, with Skype, and and we put it on YouTube so people can see the video as well. And you just explain that you know what, that's a newer technology, and your time is valuable to you, and your your you have this interesting philosophy about how you approach your time. So, could you tell me a little bit about how you do that? How and um, what suggestions do you have for uh, managing time more efficiently, and maybe some insight to how you personally have decided to manage your time and make priorities. Sure. I think that last week when we talked about this uh, in, in some respects, I, I touched on the area of understanding um, how best to utilize a person's time in the sense of giving them the information they need, clarifying for them what they need to know about their actual day-to-day -day work. In, in other words, what are you going to do? Not how are you going to do what you're going to do, but what are you going to do and what are the results that are expected for what you do? And how would you properly and effectively function within that role that you're particularly working on in that particular time. I refer to small firms who have less of the kind of uh, luxury of having one thing to do, one project to work on, and, and not being able to uh, keep themselves focused on a single target, whereas those small firms, you know, you, you have to do a myriad number of things. The owner themselves, the principal themselves, wear multitudes of hats because of the size of the firm, and there's a lot to be done in the, in the running of an operation. So the clarifying of each position and what's expected of them, the description of that position, the description of its role, responsibilities, and then specific to the project, what is, what is the project goal? What are the budgets? What are the uh, outcomes that we're striving for? What are the scheduling limitations that we have? Uh, all of those things become a part of it. And so the best way that you can you can do that is to understand what it is that's expected of you and then just focus on doing that and only do that which is expected of you and that which only you can do. And if you have the luxury of being able to delegate to someone else, which in small firms is very precious little time for that or ability to do that, then it's best to go ahead and delegate. And I, I did refer to Stephen R. Curry's, Covey's uh, book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and his his outline of what is the best way to delegate. There's only two methods from his perspective how to properly delegate and effectively delegate so that it's carried out and it's it's done in an effective, efficient way. And what are those two so, forms of delegation? Well, one is called stewardship delegation, which is an environment in which you delegate to somebody, the right person, the absolute best optimum person to do that job that's available to do that job, and they give them all the information they need to succeed, to carry out what's expected of them, to accomplish the task at the best possible level, as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Everything, support, information, resources, everything that's needed. And the other one is the gopher delegation, which says, I'm going to give you this to do and then come back and ask me what to do next. Now you can do this. Now you can do this. So go, go do this. Now you can do this. Well, that's, that's a waste of time. That's inefficient. It's, it's a very expensive me method of operating, and yet it happens because some people just don't properly understand the art of delegation. It truly is an art. So Covey did explain that, and he does a great job of doing that. So nothing that I could ever say about it could ever be improved upon from his perspective, in my opinion. Excellent. Well, for that, we will refer people to the seven habits of highly effective people. That is very easy to get a hold of, unlike your book, Financial Management for Design Professionals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Steve, this is the moment everyone's been waiting for. Financial management, 
uh, for design professionals. I'm going to talk about some of the key things that firm owners or principals or people who are thinking about starting their own firms can do to increase their profitability and make the most of the existing money that's already coming into their firm. So I wanted to start off talking about, let's get down to the basics. How should a new firm owner or anyone Tell me, let's talk about computing the hourly rate. This is a question that uh, many new architects have. How do I figure out what I'm worth? How do I figure out how much to charge for my time? Okay. Uh, well, it, it, it's kind of, a, it's part of a linear process. And and so it, it's not just a, a thing that stands alone by itself. It could, but it, it refers to and it and requires information that you may or may not have. Some of it's readily available. Some of it may not be readily available because of the way you gather information or the way you your financial management system is set up or the way your chart of accounts are set up, the way your profit loss statement reads. So it may not be readily available. Uh, last week I talked about why QuickBooks doesn't offer these kinds of benefits and why it's not a, a very good piece of software for our professional services firm. Uh, and this is part of this area of creating a billing rate. So if you if you stop and look at the elements of a billing rate, there are basically four elements, five elements to a billing rate, okay, before you can get to that billing rate. There are five basic pieces that you must know and understand and know how to apply them. The first one is your hourly labor, or the, what we call the salary that you pay an employee. If you pay an employee by uh, an annual salary, $50,000, that in and of itself breaks down to an hourly rate. So that's what we're talking about, is that, that amount of money, how much you pay somebody per hour based on their annual compensation, or I should say their annual salary, not their compensation. Uh, and it's represented as a multiple of one. It's it's a consistent one. In other words, it's the baseline information. Yep. Okay. So for every hour worked, that cost is a is a ratio of one, one to one. Yep. Now your your payroll benefits, which are those things that are required of they're customary and mandatory as a percentage of direct labor, uh, are the things that have to do with the FICA food suda, uh the workers' compensation, medical insurance, the things that you customarily do pay for your people out of the firm and what is required of you to pay by the government for your people, okay? In general, we like to say that that has a multiple of 0.35 as a percentage of direct labor, not as a percentage of the total labor, but as of the direct labor. We'll get into that in a moment, okay? The, the third thing is understanding what your overhead is, your net overhead dollar amount. Now, that's everything that's an indirect expense, again, as a percentage of direct labor. So in, in, in that kind of a parlance, the multiple for that is looked at somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5. Some firms have a lot higher overhead multiple. Some firms have a lot smaller multiple. In this case, if you took items two and three together, you're looking at 0.35 and 1.20. You're looking at 1.55 as your overhead. That essentially is your overhead rate, if you will. That has to be calculated. If you don't know how to properly calculate that number, you can't possibly do this exercise. If you don't have the right information to calculate that number, you're going to get a bad number. You're going to get misleading information, which is better than getting, better off that you get nothing because it's better to have nothing than have the wrong thing, in my opinion. All right, so at that point, if you took one, two, and three, as multiples and added them together, you have one for the labor rate, which is a salary per hour for an employee, two, the payroll benefits that you customarily and mandatorily pay for an employee as a percent of direct labor at 0.35, and then you have your net overhead, which is the additional things that are added on for your indirect expenses as a percentage of direct labor at 1.2. That adds up to 2.55, okay, or 255% of your direct labor if you will. Yep. Now, that break-even rate tells you this is the cost. This is the cost for every dollar I spend in, in salary for an employee. It costs me $2.55 just to have them here and pay them a dollar of salary every hour. So obviously, to make profit, you have to make more than 2.55%. I mean, 255% or 2.55%. Yep. Correct? Yep. Okay. 
Now the next step is to now calculate what you want as a profit. You actually can control, and this is another thing that some of my colleagues are not aware of, that they have absolute control over the amount of profit they can start with. Now, I didn't say make. I said start with when they begin a project in setting their project fees because they can define a target for that profitability for each project. By targeting a percentage of profit that built into the billing rate that goes into each hour that establishes a budget for a fee. So in my opinion, I believe that anything less than 20% profit is unwarranted, unacceptable, just it's wrong. We spent too many years in our educational process, in our in our uh, becoming experienced and learning what we had to go through uh, to get to the places where we are to not make at least 20% for our firm. We must have at least 20%. That's a reasonable return on your uh, investment in that firm. So anybody that makes less than 20%, I say, can improve upon their performance. There's room for improvement. There are some firms that make a lot more than 20%, but the preponderance of firms don't make anywhere near that. And that's a well-known, established statistic. And what would fact, be the general AI, amount that most firms are at? Well, you can't say that. I can only tell you that the AI surveys over the years have continued to show an improvement, and that has a lot to do with the new technologies, which have made things much more effective and efficient in doing the things that need to be done yeah. through technology. Uh, it, the, the rate is basically used to be established if you would make if you had an overhead rate a total overhead rate of 1.5 to 1.75 then you were probably in the range of being where you needed to be to be able to be competitive in the marketplace and make a profit mm -hmm. and now they've dropped it down to somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 i think it's even lower than 1.2 okay for some firms it is okay some firms have a lower overhead. They're just better managers of their overhead expenses, and that's the key to this thing. Mm. So I say 20% is what you really need to have. Now, here's what happens. This is the, this is the interesting thing that's not known by, by probably most of my colleagues, except those that have gone to my workshops or read my book, uh, and that is you don't develop a profit of 20% by taking your 2.55 or your 255% break-even rate and multiplying it by 20%. That will not give you 20% profit. That will give you a billing rate that has 20% built into it, but it's not 20% of your billing rate. So in order to get 20% of the billing rate to be represented with a 20% profit, you must now divide by or the complement of the targeted profit amount. So you would divide by 80% that 2.55. Have I lost you yet? Oh, absolutely. But I'm I'm waiting for you to bring it home. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm just using this as an example. If you if you had 2.55 and you divided it by 0.8, which is 80 percent, you'll come up with an answer of 3.1875. Yep. Okay. As a as a as a multiple for your billing rate. Yep. Okay. So for every dollar of labor you spend in the salary for an employee you ought to have a billing rate that's equal to 3.1875 of that amount, okay, as uh, a way to make 20% profit. Yeah. On a $10 an hour employee, that would be $31.88. That would guarantee you starting out with a 20% profit. Whereas if you just multiply the 2.55 by 20%, you'll have eliminated almost 16% of the potential of that 20% when you do that arithmetic. Yep, yep. Okay, so that's that's the best place to start and that's the best place to do it. But you can understand that if you don't know how to develop your overhead rate, none of this works. The only thing that you absolutely know without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, is how much you pay your people. You may be able to also figure out how much you pay in payroll benefits. But if you don't know what your true direct labor amount is, then you don't know what the right multiple is. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. all of these things are pieces that go into this oversized puzzle, if you will, that creates this environment of a financial management system. They all work to complement each other. They all work to feed into each other and help 
the next thing to become known, to become developed, and to be become a process of uh, bringing forth the information that's needed to make some of these good business decisions. Excellent. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about planning, Steve. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, if, if we're looking at the year ahead, so we figured out our our billing rate and that makes perfect sense and I I totally get why multiplying it by 20% does not give you the full that's you know if you think about it kind of elementary math that you're looking at the part of a whole and so you have to divide by 80% right. because 80 is the part um and that's an interesting math though once you look at the difference in if you do it one way versus the other uh that, mm-hmm. very very interesting mm-hmm. so we're planning we're planning for the future we have an idea of you know, we maybe have some past records of how our firm's doing, but what does firms need to think about when they're looking ahead to the next year and they're making either their annual profit plan or what other planning documents should they be looking at? Well, again, you know, like I have no idea what the statistical data shows, and I don't even know if it exists as a statistic. How many architectural or professional design firms actually do, one, an annual budget every year, mm-hmm. and two, how many people even know or do a profit plan to help build that annual budget. So there's a level of missing information. There's a level of unawareness. There's a level of uh, not being engaged in a process that could be helpful to them in becoming more profitable, more effective, more efficient. So doing an annual budget is a no-brainer for me because it becomes the baseline for how you measure your performance during the course of the year. If, If you don't do a budget, to go by, then you'll never know whether you're doing well or doing poorly in respect to what you budgeted. Makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. As, as Confucius said, if you don't know where you're going, you can only wind up where you're headed. <laughs> okay. So to me, doing an annual budget is something that one should start to do at the end of the year, uh, each year for the preceding, for the next year. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And what Uh, steps go into forming that annual budget? How do they go about crafting that? Well, it has a lot to do with the firm itself. As I said in the outset of my conversation last week, every firm is unique. So it it depends on that firm. How long have they been in business? Is this a brand-new startup? Well, if they are, then they have no data to go by to create a budget. They have no idea. It's all a guess. It's going to be just a swag at the best. Yeah. Most times it's just going to be something they're going to grab out of the air and, and it's not going to be worth very much, but that's okay. You have to start somewhere. It's better than not doing anything. Mm-hmm. So if they're a firm that has some kind of a history, a historical background, I don't care how good or bad that is. I don't care how correct or incorrect it might be, whatever their process has been, it's something to build on. So I suggest that you start with at least the past three years of historical data about your finances for each of the past three years. How did you do in each of these categories that are going to be part of building this budget? Okay? And and for me, you have to begin with the thing that means the most to the firm, which is the lifeblood of the firm, which is the revenue that the firm brings in each year. Okay? I'm not talking about dollars received. I'm talking about revenue earned. There's a real difference between the two. And for the sake of my approach, for the sake of the world that I live in, and the sake of the world that I do work in, I say, in in a general way of explaining it simply, accounting is the realm of dollars received and dollars paid out, leaving you with tax liability to the government. Either you have one or you don't have one. Okay? Whatever's left over is something you're going to have to pay taxes on unless you choose to distribute it all before you have to pay taxes and let someone else pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. Meaning you give out money to yourself and your staff as bonuses. But the realm of financial management is only dealing with what you've earned. This is time you've spent and it's what's created the earned revenue for your firm. In, In the financial parlance, that I use, the word net operating revenue is a key term because it is those dollars that are left to your firm that tell you from these dollars, we're now going to spend a certain amount of money and we're going to earn a profit on this amount of money. 
which we hope will be at least 20% after paying all salaries and all expenses and all consultants and all vendors. So working on that front end is the most important part of it. Now, okay. in, in that in that respect, I say that the, the, the net operating revenue deals with three basic elements, and that is direct labor, overhead, and profit. Those are the three things that you're going to need to know about. Okay. Well, those components of net operating revenue take on different forms, and they, and they are distributed differently through the profit loss statement. But essentially, if you thought about it, when you look at a profit loss statement, you can pick up these three categories really easily, and they will show you that in an in a average firm across the board, if you took them across the board, the median of those kinds of relationships, the ratio between those three things is, looks like direct labor attributes 30% of what your revenue earned is. You're going to spend 30% of it on direct labor. Another 60% is going to go to paying overhead expenses. So what does that leave you? That leaves you with a paltry 10% as profit. So here the goal is, is to enhance that 10%. Well, where do you think that's going to come from? Well, there's two places, and those are the two things that we just talked about, direct labor and overhead. The direct labor can be controlled by establishing a project fee budget, which can be controlled by understanding what your overhead rate is and creating a billing rate that has a built-in profitability to it and a schedule that makes sense to do the kinds of things that have to be done within the scope of services on the contract to deliver the project from beginning to end and make the profit that you wanted. And if you spend more than 30%, if that's what you budgeted, you're going to lose money. Why? Because you're spending more money to pay somebody to do a thing that wasn't intended. Mm -hmm. So it's got to come from somewhere. It comes from your profitability. So if you can reduce your... Uh, direct labor to less than 30%, you might create greater profitability. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room in that number. Mm. The, the realm that I live in is a, is a range between 28 and 32% of net operating revenue that goes to direct labor. So where's the bigger thing? The big thing is in that big hulk of money called 60% of the overhead expenses. Well, in, in its simplest form, you know, I simply say this. If you can save a dollar of overhead expense, you'll create a dollar of profit. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Find a way to reduce 60% and increase it to a profit of 20% means you've got to get your overhead down to 50% to get a 20% profit if your direct labor stays at 30. Mm. Got it. Got it. And just to refresh here, uh, last time we did talk about well, actually, this time we talked about we just finished talking about the uh, what goes into uh, into overhead, and uh, some of the things were the 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 FICA and payroll taxes, workers' compensation, um, and then of course the indirect labor costs. Right, and then all of the operational costs of keeping a firm running: your rent, utilities, telephone. rent. Yep. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what, what's the biggest one that you've seen in terms of reducing that big 60% number? You know, where, what's the first place to start hacking at the, the limbs? Well, uh, become aware of what you're spending. If you don't know yeah. what you're spending, you can't reduce it. So the, the first place is where I almost always begin with my clients. My work with my clients and, and essentially you know, what, I, what I basically am focused on is I get started with a new client. I have one goal in mind. My goal is primarily to work with a client to help them achieve their actual goals for their firm so they'll have the success that they, that they perceive and they have a vision for. Mm -hmm. If I can do that, then I'm successful. Okay? Yep. Well, over the last 29 years, my work has encompassed the broadest range of any kind of, of uh, business operations within a, within a firm except for that that relates to design management and marketing strategy. I, I don't do either one of those things. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this process over this long 29-year journey, without exception, I have found that my initial work will always relate to somehow identifying the optimum financial management system for the firm and the resources that are required to get the best results from it. So it almost always goes back to something to do with money yep. and how to better control it, 
how to better manage it, and how to get an enhanced amount of money in the profit side of it. So where do we look? If we're looking to reduce overhead, give me one or two examples of where we can start, or maybe examples of areas where you think there's the low-hanging fruit. Okay, I'm going to start with direct labor because I think it's a key place. A lot of firms cannot attain this range of 28 to 32 percent of net operating revenue for their direct labor. And the reason they don't have success in doing that is twofold. One, many of them don't even know that there's such a range that they should be in. Two, they don't know how to calculate that range because they don't have the right tools to do so. And then three, they don't have any kind of a game plan for how to run a project called the project fee budget. If they do have a project fee budget, it got set aside a long time ago once the project got started. And so I'm going to go back to a very basic process that has to do with understanding when you receive a request for a proposal from a client, they're asking you to come up with a fee proposal. Well, all too often, and I, I've witnessed this and experienced this in my own career working for firms, even, even in the large firm that I worked for for 11 and a half years. The, the fee is developed on the basis of, well, we did something like this last year or two years ago, and it was in this ballpark, and we did really well with it, so let's make the fee this. That fee plus an, a, an increase of X percent. They take the easy way out. They take what I call the lazy way out. Okay, you know, that's a choice. That's a business decision. I'm not going to be judgmental about that. I don't think it's the right way to go. I don't think it's, it's in their best interest to do that. But that's a decision that someone makes that's in charge. The best process is to every single project, sit down and do a project fee budget that entails understanding what the scope of work is, how many, how many kinds of tasks are involved in each piece of the scope of the work, and then assigning the number of hours to accomplish those tasks, and then assigning an individual or individuals that require to be involved in those tasks and what their billing rate is, or basically their break-even rate is, to establish what the cost will be to deliver that project that they've identified, and then put the 20% on top of that, or take it, divide it by 80%, and come up with a 20% built-in profit, and that's your fee. Well, even those firms that may do all that, that absolutely are, are pristine and, and deliberate and right on target and doing all of that, may, some of them may, then send that fee proposal out and never look at it again during the course of the project. It doesn't become the baseline for their operation. It was just a way of getting a fee. So they don't manage it well. They don't monitor it in respect to that profit, uh, that project fee budget. So they wind up again getting what they get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a place where you can save money. That 28 to 32 percent is not some some wild guess as what you ought to be at. It's an efficient range. If you remain in that efficient range, you are able to get a project done, make your targeted profitability, and reduce the amount of expense it's going to cost. But therein lies a whole range of things that have to do with understanding your employees and, and how they function, how they operate, and why I feel so strongly about this whole thing about employee retention and investing the time to develop them and, and build them up and, and teach them how to do things properly, give them the information they need to succeed instead of fail. Left to their own devices, they'll do the best they can. No question about it. They're all professionals. But they don't understand. They don't understand some of the things they could be doing or what they shouldn't be doing. And so they go off the rails. And they spend money that was never intended to be spent. But they don't know what you told them. How many budgets are shared with the staff? How many budgets have been given to the staff, and whether it's dollars or hours? You have this, this is your project. This is the number of hours you have to complete it for us to make the profit margin that we established for this project, which is 20%. Your job is to make this project come in at 20%, and these are the hours you have to manage it. Now, that's not a directive that's locked in stone. Yes, it's locked in stone as a fee, but at that point, if you haven't already discussed this with your project manager who's going to manage the project and gotten their feedback to see if your number is realistic in terms of your estimated hours of doing the project, you're already at a loss. You're already at a, at a disadvantage yeah. because you're doing it after the fact. Mm -hmm. So it's inclusive. It's a, it's a collaborative process. 
mm-hmm. with all of the right people involved in the decision-making process, and then one person makes the final decision about what it needs to be. Yep. And then that person who makes that decision should be held accountable for having made that decision, beneficial or not beneficial to the firm. Mm-hmm. So that locks into this whole culture of accountability. And each person there under becomes accountable for their performance under that game plan that's been established and carrying it out, managing it, and monitoring so everybody succeeds. And what suggestions do you have for encouraging stewardship or a uh, sense of ownership when we're talking about these um, project fee budgets to give to give staff members incentive to meet that? Well, uh, again, in my world, if you're living in a culture of accountability, then you already know because it's been established and it's been uh, communicated to everybody clearly, openly, so everybody understands that you're going to share in the profit of this firm somehow, some way. Some firms set up profit-sharing plans, okay? But my problem with profit-sharing plans is that not everybody should get the same amount of money because not everybody contributes to the same level. So why would the highest performer be satisfied getting the same amount of money as the lowest performer, as a profit share, or as a bonus? Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's what happens. So you've you've got to be able to let them know this is what is going to happen in this program. You contribute to this program, we will evaluate your contribution, we will sit down with you and talk about it, and we will come up with a reward, a compensation for you, because you've contributed to it. And if I have the ability to control my financial destiny by working more effectively, more efficiently, working smarter instead of harder, understanding what's expected of me, what the what the criteria are to work with, I'm going to do the best possible job I can so I can make the best possible return on my invested time. It it works like a, 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 a stimulator, a motivator, if you will for those who see that as as a realm in which they will benefit. I said it's some people are not motivated by money. Okay, maybe you do such a great job, you're now going to be promoted to the next level up. You're no longer a project architect, now you're going to be a project manager. You're no longer a project manager, now you're going to be a project director. You're no longer a project director, now you're going to be the next level up. You're going to be appointed as an officer of the firm. You become a principal or or you become a, a, uh, a, uh, a partner, junior partner. I mean, associate principal, I mean, whatever the titles are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they're incentives to doing a better job that's clearly delineated and explained to you in advance. So you've created an environment in which everybody wants to do the best possible job because you've answered the question, what's in it for me? Yep. How would you suggest that firms go about structuring a plan that compensates top performers better than other people that aren't performing as well? I'm sorry. I lost the thread on that. No problem, no problem. Yeah. Um, So uh, in in a practical application, how would a firm go about structuring some sort of compensation plan? And you mentioned that it should be individual and it should, you should have a dialogue with the, with the staff members to see, you know, what their hot buttons are. So you can, you know what incentives they want. How do you translate that into the process of then deciding who gets, you know, who gets more and who gets less of the, of the, so-called profit share? Is this something that happens in the performance evaluations? And how have you seen that applied successfully? Okay, I, I want to make a distinction right now. In, like, in my opinion, my, my way of thinking and seeing this is that performance reviews do not automatically lead to salary increases or the size of a bonus mm-hmm. okay. or, or, or advancement. They are simply there as a way of letting you know how you did in the last 12 months relative to the goals you set for these last 12 months. And what are going to be the new goals we're going to set for the next 12 months so you can do as well, better than you did Mm -hmm. in the past 12 months. Once you have this performance review, the answer from those things will be a contribution to the decision-making process about how this decision is made, about who gets what and how much. Mm -hmm. And, and it isn't necessarily discussed with the individual. Now, you're going to get 15% or you're going to get – that's that's not discussed in that performance review. It has no place in a performance review. It could come from a discussion after the fact once the decision is made to sit them down and explain to them, this is the outcome of your performance for the last year. We are going to do a distribution of profit through bonuses. 
There are going to be performance bonuses. As you know, that's our policy. We do performance bonuses. Mm -hmm. And your performance has been rated as such, which means that you're in the upper X percent of the, the staff, entitling you to a Based on your salary, a percentage of increase equal a percentage of bonus equal to X amount of dollars, and the same thing true for the salary. So, it's a it's a policy. It's a it's a formula. It's a it's an absolute established methodology for coming up with this, and it's decided by the key people in the firm, and it may be some of the key staff members as well as the principals, not just principals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's been a very good conversation, Steve. Did you have anything okay. that you felt like you wanted to add to the conversation before we finish up? Something that maybe we didn't hit on as much as you would like or uh, another well, topic I, that you I feel that's I, important? i tell you what I'd like to just say. Um, I, I would hope that my comments are not taken as criticism of my colleagues. I don't criticize my colleagues. I don't judge my colleagues. I'm just aware of the things that I would like for them to learn and to know that would be beneficial to them. It's what my consulting practice is all about. It's what my focus is. I come to my business with a servant's heart to do whatever it takes to help my clients succeed and achieve the successes for their firm. Uh, but I'm never going to tell a client something they want to hear. I'm only going to tell them what they need to know. What they do with that information is up to them, and I'll accept their answer and I'll accept their decision. But mm -hmm. I'm not being critical in any way. I'm just simply so passionate about the reasons why we as a profession should be doing so much better than we are. And it has to do with education about the things we're engaged in or the things that need to be engaged in that we're not engaged in because we don't know any better. Steve, if people want to find out more about how you work and how to get a hold of you, where where should they go? Well... <laughs> It's an interesting question. I'm in the process of creating a brand new website. My website is 15 years old, and it's woefully out of date. Uh, a lot of the information about me is out of date. Even the contact information is out of date because I moved six months ago to the Austin area. So uh, if, if in your posting of this you might be able to include my information, I'm willing to have you do that. It's just fine with me. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, you have that information, and we can talk about this after the fact and make sure that you have the right information where to go. Yep. But I'm 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 delighted to hear from anybody that has comments, has a critique of the things that I has an alternate approach to the thing. I'm wide open. I'm flexible. I'm listening to whatever they have to say, uh, and and I'm just delighted to be able to engage in a conversation about these subjects because th it's my passion. Well, I can tell, and thank you for spreading the knowledge and spreading that information. We can tell that there's years and years and years of experience that you've been able to um, display and, and talk about in a very succinct manner, I think. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Steve, thank you for being on the Business of Architecture show, and please hold on the line because I'd like to get that contact information from you. Absolutely. All right. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.